All right, let's go ahead and get started. So um, for this Grand Rounds, I decided that since it's flu season, that would be a good opportunity to update everyone on uh, the current recommendations for So it'd be a good opportunity to kind of update everyone on um, where we are with influenza, um, current status of flu in the country, and what the current recommendations are for uh, prevention of influenza as well as, as treatment of children who um, either don't respond to the vaccine or who have uh, not gotten the vaccine and get influenza. I also want to remind everybody that 100 years ago, we had the worst pandemic ever in recorded history, where hundreds of thousands of people, right, 100 years ago in October of 1918, there were thousands of people dying every day across the United States due to a uh, strain of influenza that was uh, probably the most deadly of any uh, strain that we've dealt with. And that remnants, the genetic remnants of that strain, continue to circulate in the current uh, influenza viruses uh, that um, we see every year in the United States. So uh, no financial uh, relationships to disclose. So the main thing I want to do is make everybody realize that influenza occurs as an annual epidemic of varying uh, severity, which is unpredictable. Um, and it, it, each year, it has significant morbidity and mortality for children, um, as well as uh, for uh, adults and individuals who have a number of underlying medical conditions. And then, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about our the current recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the use of flu vaccine and the diagnosis and treatment. So as I said, um, each year, we have an epidemic of influenza. Some are mild, some are severe, but we have it every year. And again, as the strains emerge that are going to be predominant in, that, in the current season, we really don't know how severe that season's going to be until it happens. Uh, I've already mentioned that there's significant morbidity and mortality for children, um, but pregnant women have a higher um, risk for complications of influenza during pregnancy and within the postpartum period. Healthy infants under six months of age, uh, we can't immunize them. So they um, are, if they get influenza, uh, they uh, turn out to have a high risk for hospitalization um, as well as mortality. Uh, children under two years of age, uh, so down two years of age to birth, they have a higher rate overall of hospitalization than adults 65 and older in most influenza years. And then I mentioned to, uh, patients with chronic conditions um, have an increased risk of uh, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And 65 years of age and older, um, another risk group for uh, complications. Influenza is the number one vaccine preventable cause of death of children in the United States. So, so just to kind of give you a little background of uh, the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. Uh, this is a virus that spread around the world within a nine-month period of time um, before there were airplanes. And when you had to take a boat across the ocean, that would take you seven to 10 days. Um, 30 to, uh, estimates of 30 to 100 million deaths associated with this uh, virus within that short period of time. And the records in many countries are not as good as they were in the United States at that time. So we really don't know how many people died of influenza. But we know in the United States, um, roughly um, a quarter to a half of the population was uh, infected, 25 um, plus million infections. Over 600,000 people died of influenza. 20% were in. Um, children less than or equal to five years of age, 50% occurred in the 20 to 30 year old age group. So this was a virus that was very different than most strains of influenza, which caused a number of deaths in individuals 65 years of age and older. In fact, current circulating strains 
probably 90 plus percent of the deaths with influenza are in adults 65 and older. Uh, but in this case, 50% uh, of the deaths occurred in 20 to 30 year olds. Um, and of uh, soldiers in World War I, half of the deaths of the soldiers in World War I were due to complications of influenza. So where did influenza, this pandemic, start? Well, nobody really knows where it started. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that it started in Kansas. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of, um, of work trying to figure out where this uh, virus uh, came from. But um, those of you who know John Barry, uh, the author, historian, who was at Tulane and, um, and Loyola, um, he wrote a book called The Great Influenza. And uh, I certainly suggest that any of you interested in influenza read that book. It's really uh, well done, and it gives a great history of the events from the medical side as well as the public side um, of, of associated with that outbreak. And um, so in his research, um, he actually found something that no one else had found um, in, in prior research for the uh, pandemic. Um, and what he found was there was a physician in Haskell County, which is in that red square in southwest Kansas, um, that was uh, sent a letter to the US Public Health Service saying that he was seeing the worst influenza that he'd ever seen with a lot of people with pneumonia and the number of deaths in his town. Um, and that <clears throat> town at that point was sending young adults to um, uh, Camp uh, Funston, which was now part of Fort Riley in Kansas, where people were training for um, entry into World War I. Um, and uh, so um, it's very possible that the same virus that was causing this problem there ended up with some of the recruits um, in uh, Camp Funston uh, developing uh, influenza. So in, at that point, um, that was a farming area. They had cattle, they had hogs, and right, this is a, 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 a county that is uh, right along the flyway of 17 different bird species. We'll talk about why that's important in a couple of minutes. So um, he reported this in January. By March 4th, the first soldier w reported ill with influenza at Camp Funston. Within two weeks, over 1,000 soldiers were admitted to the hospital, and thousands were ill in their barracks. 38 of them died. So it's very clear that there was a big <clears throat> outbreak of a pretty severe disease. Um, and then um, it turned out within a few months, so by March, there's the same sort of influenza in 24 to 36 Army training camps across the United States. So with troops moving back and forth and, um, and, and with training in close quarters, um, it's very clear that there was a great opportunity for this virus to spread uh, amongst a lot of people in a very short period of time. But then something happened in October where um, this virus was bad enough, causing severe disease as well as some deaths. But simultaneously in three areas in France, Boston, and this was a camp in France and a camp in Northern Africa, outbreaks of the more severe, the most severe form of influenza were beginning to be reported. Now, these were the cases where young adults um, within 24, 48, 72 hours would develop an acute illness have a hemorrhagic type of pneumonia and die. And so this was something that no one had seen before. Um, and this was what then spread across the United States from October through uh, March of, the, of, uh, of 1919. Um, and again, um, this was the more severe, most severe form of the, of the virus. And then by 1920, it evolved back to a, a milder form of influenza um, and this great pandemic uh, was over. But this just tells you that um, this virus has the capability of changing pretty rapidly through genetic mutations um, and uh, can result in pretty severe disease and, um, um, and, and then certainly continues to pose a significant risk. So uh, from the military, it got into the communities, and that led to the, the cases that I've talked about and the total number of deaths that 
that uh, were reported. Um, social uh, distancing was part of the, the plan for management of this, and, and so schools were closed, movie theaters were closed, public places, libraries, every, everybody was asked to, um, to keep their distance, and um, as an attempt to control um, the spread of this uh, infection. So how does this happen? Well, influenza viruses um, uh, are, there, there are a number of different properties that, that make possible what we saw in 1918-19 and what we see every year. So influenza viruses, they're, they're the A's, influenza A and influenza B are the two influenza virus types that are most likely uh, are going to cause disease in humans. Um, a tends to be more severe. Uh, but that's not always the case. Um, the A viruses are typed by their surface proteins, there's hemagglutinin, which um, helps the virus attach and get into cells, and then there's neuraminidase, which is important for the virus to be released from cells. And these, so these two are protein uh, spikes that come off the surface of the virus, um, and the antigens of these two protein spikes, as the viruses circulate, the, the proteins mutate and there are changes in the antigenicity of those uh, two surface proteins. Um, influenza B viruses uh, um, have the same uh, makeup, but they are not divided by their surface proteins. They're divided based on their background, so they're divided by lineages. Um, and currently, we have four types of influenza virus co-circulating each year. This has been going on for a number of years. So we have a Influenza A, which is a H1N1, and that's sort of the, the, the descendant of the 1918, 19 is a, a, a virus. There's the H3N2, and then there are two uh, Bs, one's a Victoria lineage and one's Yamagata. Uh, so as these proteins get modified on the virus, if there's a mild or uh, a, a minimal change in the protein, and it, and the antigens that are there, that's called an antigenic drift. So what that means is that if you've had influenza in the past, if you've had influenza vaccine, if there's a mild change in the antigen, you might get some protection from a prior infection or prior vaccine uh, if that virus is very close to the previous one. On the other hand, if there's a major change in that protein so that your immune system doesn't recognize that, uh, you will have no protection. Um, and that's an antigenic shift. And so major antigenic shifts result in a large part of the population being susceptible to influenza, and that means that more people are going to get infected, and if it's a more severe strain of virus, then you may have, and with the capability of going from person to person quite effectively, then you have um, a pandemic. Um, so um, these are some of the, so do you become immune to the virus that you um, are, uh, are exposed to, uh, but then as the virus mutates and changes its antigens, you are not protected against subsequent types of virus. So the interesting thing about influenza, it's an RNA virus, the, the, its uh, <coughs> genetic makeup is divided into eight separate uh, RNA segments. Um, and it turns out that the primary reservoir of influenza uh, viruses um, are birds. Uh, the viruses live in the GI tract of those birds. In most cases, don't make the birds sick. Um, there are a couple exceptions to that. But um, uh, then, uh, <clears throat> as the viruses are, are being uh, produced in cells, the, there can be reassortment of the, of the genes. and um, and so one by mutation, <coughs> we have changing uh, viruses. But then number two, in addition to birds, two other animals uh, can, uh, are, in, are commonly infected by influenza. And then influenza can be propagated amongst them. And they are pigs and humans. So in Haskell County, um, uh, <coughs> Kansas, there were pigs, there were people, and there were birds. And so if there is a chance of a co-infection with a, a bird strain and a pig strain or a human strain or all three, there's a chance that there can be reassortment of genes so you emerge with an entirely new virus. And that's 
what is uh, thought to have happened um, that led to um, this dramatic new virus um, that, uh, that uh, seemed to potentially come out of uh, Haskell County. So <coughs> this shows you um, some of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, some of the um, excess of deaths from um, um, any cause related to influenza with, uh, associated with various uh, strains of circulating virus going back to 1918, 1919. And actually, um, the reason that this was thought to be swine influenza in 1918-19 was that the first time influenza virus was ever isolated, it was in the early 1930s, by a veterinarian, he isolated it from pigs. Um, and um, when um, he then took that, uh, and pigs were becoming ill with, with this virus, he took the virus and then did neutralization studies in um, individuals uh, at varying ages, and it turned out that anybody who was alive in 1918 had antibody to this virus. Uh, so they thought that perhaps this virus came from pigs, um, and that's why it was thought that maybe it was swine, but in fact, uh, further studies indicate that that probably came from birds and infected both pigs and humans at the same time. So um, the initial 1918-1919 uh, pandemic virus was called Spanish flu. So why was it called Spanish flu? Well, it wasn't because people thought it came from Spain. It was because with World War I going on, there was a, uh, uh, the press was uh, not really allowed to, uh, uh, do, to report anything that was really negative that was going on. And Spain was not a combatant in World War I, and the King of Spain developed influenza. Um, and so uh, that was the front page, front page news in Spain, and it became Spanish flu because the King of Spain um, had influenza. Um, and uh, other uh, papers in other countries were censored. Um, so that's where the Spanish flu name came from. And then you see we've had four subsequent pandemics um, in, in, around the world. Um, and, um, um, and, and you can see, though, if you look at the mortality uh, associated with the uh, H1N1 pandemic, it was 598 per 100,000. You've not achieved gotten anywhere near that in subsequently, but you can see that the, um, the Asian flu was associated with an antigenic shift, so we went from H1N1 to H2N2, and then the Hong Kong flu, uh, 1968, that's where the H3N2 virus came from, um, and then uh, in 1977, when the H3N2 virus came, H1N1 disappeared. So it didn't circulate for a number of years. And then all of a sudden it came back in 1977. Um, um, and since that time, there's been co-circulation of both of these uh, H3N2 uh, and H1N1. Um, there's some thought that the reemergence uh, of the Russian flu was because Russia was experimenting with the H1N1 nasal uh, vaccine, live attenuated vaccine, and that may have reverted back to a more virulent uh, strain, um, and that might be the one that is currently circulating. And then we had what you're all familiar with, we had the swine flu pandemic in 2009, um, which was a significant change in the H1N1 uh, virus, which was a reassortant virus that had elements in genetics of uh, avian, pig, and human um, uh, virus, and that's what led to um, the pandemic that we had then. And again, that pandemic uh, was relatively worse for children and pregnant women than it was for others. And in fact, the morbidity for 65-year-olds and, and older was uh, significantly less with that virus than in previous seasons. So what about last year? So this is uh, uh, data from last year. Last year, uh, we had uh, what the CDC called uh, a high severity season. There were over 80,000 deaths associated with influenza 
in the U.S. last year. Uh, we had widespread elevated activity for an extended period of time. It was predominantly an H3N2 year, um, and it ended up for children. There were um, lots of outpatient emergency department visits, high hospitalization rates, and um, uh, a number of pediatric deaths. So H3N2 was the predominant strain, but towards the end of the season, we began to see emergence of influenza B, which is not unusual when you have co-circulating influenza viruses that in one part of the season, one type will come to your community, cause an outbreak, which may last two to four weeks, then that sort of abates, and then the next uh, virus comes into town, um, and then you have another outbreak. So that you can have two or three or more outbreaks within the same community with different types of influenza virus each year. So um, the thing that's important about hospitalizations is that um, some of the individuals who are hospitalized have underlying conditions and some do not. And so I want to make it clear that there are children who have no underlying uh, known risk factor who end up hospitalized with severe uh, influenza or complications of influenza. This is a table from the CDC, and the CDC has this uh, program called Flu View, which you can go every week and see what influenza activity is like in the United States, and it will help monitor it for you so you can know what's going on in your, in your state and what's going on in the rest of the country. If you look at, um, the, the slide has um, the admissions to the hospital and from hospitals that um, are in their system to monitor for influenza-related hospitalization. So these are proven influenza cases. In green are children, in, in blue are adults, and then in this little purple color are pregnant uh, women. So, um, and these are the different underlying conditions, cardiovascular, pulmonary, metabolic, and so on. 43% of pediatric cases have no underlying uh, condition. I don't know if you can see that, but that's this this line right here. Twenty-six percent had asthma, reactive airway disease, so one of the most common risk factors that get children into the hospital with influenza, underlying pulmonary problem. 16.8% uh, had neurologic disorder. This has become more clear over the last, actually first became clear with the 2009 pandemic, that children who can't handle their respiratory secretion, cerebral palsy, other neurologic conditions, have a much higher risk of, with, of complications and hospitalization uh, with influenza. And of women who are 15 to 44 years of age, so childbearing age, 29% of them who were admitted to the hospital were pregnant. So pregnancy is an incredibly high risk factor for complications of influenza. So here's a pediatric uh, death. So in, in um, early 2000s, pediatric mortality due to influenza became reportable disease. And so each year, somewhere between 100 to 200 children die of influenza in this country. Um, and this is the, the annual um, thing. The highest was in 2009 when almost 300 children died. But um, there were 183 deaths last year. Um, influenza A was responsible for 106, B to, to 68. 51% had an underlying condition. So 49% were otherwise healthy children who died of influenza. 78% were unvaccinated. So um, it's a really important um, piece of information um, that uh, it's, it's common, it's a problem, and um, most kids who die are unvaccinated. And this is this year. We've already had two influenza reported deaths in the United States this year, and that's without much flu activity going on. So just to get a little bit more <clears throat> information about influenza-related deaths, um, in the years 2010 to 16, there were 675 reported influenza uh, 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 death, related deaths reported to CDC. And again, half with no pre-existing medical condition. 73% um, were unimmunized um, and uh, here are the mortality rates, but you can see that the highest mortality rate is amongst children who are, uh, we can't vaccinate. They're under six months of age. 0.66 per 100,000. 
overall 0.15. And then again, the children under two months, under two years of age, um, double that mortality rate overall for children. So again, young children highly affected by influenza severity disease and mortality. And then this just shows you uh, again how it varies from season to season. Not only pediatric deaths; these are the number of deaths. And here's the 2009-10 pandemic: 288 deaths. Uh, hospitalization rates for 100,000 children, you can see it varies. So we have some mild flu years, and then we have some very severe flu years. Um, and then um, this is for zero to four years old and five to 17. So children who are older do a little better, but they're certainly not um, without the risk for uh, hospitalization. Um, <clears throat> so does vaccine prevent mortality? This is a study that uh, was just published last year, a case cohort study looking at children who died of influenza from 2010 to 2014. And those comparing uh, their vaccine records with the um, um, number of children that would be, that were vaccinated in that age group. And you can see vaccine effectiveness was 65%. So there was 65% reduction in mortality associated with getting influenza vaccine. So clearly the vaccine prevents uh, pediatric deaths. And with underlying conditions, it was still over 50%. So I'm not gonna go through this, but just to remind you that there are many, many individuals who have a chronic condition um, who are at increased risk for um, uh, influenza, so for severe disease and increased mortality. Um, and obviously, as uh, people get older and develop a number of chronic conditions, a uh, significant percentage of the adult population is at increased risk before you get to age 65, and then certainly that in that's increased after that as well. So you just, when, when we try and get people immunized, we want everybody immunized, but you want to make a special effort to make sure that you get those people that are at increased risk uh, vaccinated as well. So um, there is a sort of a classic presentation of influenza that you're all familiar with. You have a sudden onset, high fever, chills, muscle aches, uh, so myalgia, um, your eyes hurt, um, and uh, you may have mild sore throat, a little bit of a cough, um, and a little bit of a runny or stuffy nose. Um, that's sort of the classic presentation, but a lot of people don't have that when they have influenza. So that can tell you you have influenza in your community, um, and, in, and in fact, a significant number of the, ch of the children that you see will have those findings. But some will present with an acute respiratory illness without fever. So the trying to decide between a cold and influenza becomes really difficult. And so when you have influenza in your community, anybody with respiratory symptoms should be considered as potentially being a patient who has influenza. Um, so <clears throat> then the other things that you might see, um, headache, fatigue, um, conjunctival injection, and then abdominal pain in young children uh, may present more with vomiting and diarrhea than with respiratory symptoms. So again, there's a wide spectrum of presentations of influenza. Um, common complication, you know, when you have influenza in the community and you're working in the emergency room, you're gonna see a lot of kids with febrile seizures. Um, you're gonna see a lot of kids with complications towards the middle or the end of their influenza case. They're gonna end up with otitis media, um, sinusitis, um, croup, some of the worst cases of croup you'll see are in kids who have influenza A infection. Um, they may have a pertussis-like uh, cough, uh, bronchiolitis, and there is a viral pneumonia, an influenza pneumonia that accompanies um, a primary inf uh, an infection. Kids with um, uh, fever and um, uh, poor appetite or vomiting and diarrhea can come in dehydrated, and then there is an acute myositis syndrome associated with influenza, particularly influenza B, where children will have pain in their, mostly in their gastrocnemius muscles, and they'll, they'll decide that they, it's too painful to walk or they'll walk on their toes. 
um, crypto. Um, and uh, so that's an important thing to kind of look for. And since influenza B tends to be the later um, entry into the community, um, you're often going to see this towards the end of flu season in the early to mid-spring. And then there are more severe um, uh, neurologic complications in addition to the benign febrile seizures. Um, there's a severe encephalopathy, encephalitis, and then obviously people who are taking aspirin. Uh, Rye syndrome um, was uh, um, one of the first infections related to Rye syndrome that was uh, influenza. So influenza is a common preceding event uh, with aspirin use uh, to lead to Rye syndrome. And that's one of the reasons why we don't use uh, aspirin in children anymore uh, to control fever or pain. So other serious complications, um, pneumonia, um, uh, with a secondary bacterial uh, infection is really important. It's been well recognized for a number of years uh, that uh, the strep, group A strep, Staph aureus, and pneumococcus, pneumococcus number one for adults, um, are important secondary pathogens that, that cause disease. We have a child with cystic fibrosis who has MRSA, pneumonia and respiratory failure associated with influenza infection. That's a well-described phenomenon. Um, and, uh, and so it's really important that people understand that when a patient has influenza and then the symptoms are getting suddenly worse, especially three, four, five days into the illness, that you need to be thinking about, uh, if it's respiratory symptoms, the possibility that there's a secondary bacterial pneumonia. And the MRSA makes it even more difficult today terms of choosing appropriate therapy. Um, they can sometimes present with a nonspecific sepsis-like picture, especially younger children. And then uh, there are occasional cases of myocarditis as well. So <clears throat> season so far, again from flu view, uh, there are a number of states that are already reporting, including Louisiana, sporadic influenza <coughs> activity. It's not unusual this time of the year. We certainly, in addition to the case I just mentioned, we've seen, gotten calls from physicians in the community who've had a few kids who are positive for influenza. So it's uh, not a surprise that it's beginning now. Uh, the peak month <coughs> can vary from year to year. It could be November, December, January. Most often it's going to be January or February, but it, it, can, it can peak. Uh, any time within that time frame, and you can still see activity out through May um, in, in some years. So, <coughs> this was uh, 1919. Um, best way to avoid influenza was to gargle daily. Uh, I don't know how well that worked, but today, just to get vaccines. So, the most important way we have today to prevent influenza is influenza vaccine. Now, it's not the best vaccine that we have. Um, it just it varies in, in its ability to uh, prevent infection. Um, some of it is because when the vaccine is uh, strains are determined, uh, the virus is still circulating in the southern hemisphere, and it may change its antigenicity before it comes to the northern hemisphere. And so the virus may not be very well matched to the vaccine that was made to try and prevent the infection. So one of the problems is um, that the virus changes after the vaccine strains are chosen. The second problem that has just recently been discovered is that when the viruses are chosen and they're adapted to grow in eggs, which was the primary way that influenza vaccines were made for many, many years, that adaptation and the growth in the eggs often results in some antigenic changes in the neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin of the virus. And so the, even though we, it was matched to begin with, by the time it was egg adapted, it wasn't as well matched. So that also is a reason why in some years the vaccine prevents 70 percent of infection. Sometimes it's 20 percent. Last year with the H3N2 change during the, before the season started and in some of the, of, the, of, the, of the H3N2s that were circulating, um, we didn't have a very good match. And so we're down to 23 or 30, and I think the latest preliminary results are about a 
overall protection from vaccine. But when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people infected with the virus, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations, if you can prevent 30 to 40 or 50 percent of them, that's a pretty big number. And that's a lot of people who are fully protected. In addition, even if the vaccine doesn't protect you fully from influenza, it can modify the course so that you might get some partial protection. So vaccine is the best thing we have to uh, prevent influenza right now. So the major uh, way that the vaccines were produced for a number of years was through um, growth in embryonated eggs. And that's changed pretty dramatically now. And so we're going to probably see over time an evolution of, uh, of, of types of production of influenza vaccine uh, that we hope are, is going to um, create a vaccine that is, is, has a greater effectiveness in the population. Um, and then there's even hope that uh, we may be able to find some antigens in the stalk of the hemagglutinin or the neuraminidase that might better create a universal influenza vaccine so we don't have to get a, a vaccine every year. But that's, we'll see what happens. So um, obviously as the virus has changed, the vaccine has to change, and we need a vaccine every year because there are new viruses. So the, the vaccine is formulated each year in an attempt to match the serotypes that are expected to circulate. Um, the two major types are inactivated vaccine and live attenuated vaccine. The inactivated vaccines are, are called split virus vaccines. We don't give whole virus um, uh, vaccines. We give uh, components of the vaccine, and the, the, the primary component of the inactivated vaccine is hemagglutinin. And um, there are trivalent vaccines and quadrivalent vaccines. Uh, everybody six months of age uh, and older can get an inactivated vaccine. There's a live attenuated vaccine. These are the nasal spray. Um, uh, this is the nasal spray vaccine. It is only available as a quadrivalent vaccine, and it's licensed for, for um, individuals 2 to 49 years of age who are otherwise healthy, so they don't have underlying medical conditions that would increase their risk for influenza complications. So this year, uh, a new H3N2 was added to the trivalent vaccine. Um, and a new B was added, was, was in the trivalent vaccine, a new Victoria linkage, uh, lineage, and then the quadrivalent vaccine has a second B. And the reason for the two Bs is that it's been very hard to predict which of the Bs was going to be the primary virus that circulated. For 10 years, they tried to pick it. Turned out they were right half the time, 50% of the time. So it was clear that they were, it was a guess. And so, the quadrivalent vaccines were then developed to try and um, get the protection against all four. Um, in, in the beginning, very few manufacturers uh, made quadrivalent. Now they're all producing quadrivalent vaccines, and so that's going to be the, uh, the kind of the future for now, uh, quadrivalent vaccines. So the inactivated vaccines, the majority are still egg-based, um, um, and they're called inactivated influenza vaccines three or four, based on whether they're tri or quadrivalent. There are, <clears throat> for most children, we're giving the intramuscular vaccine. Individuals 18 years and older, there's an intradermal form. There's a higher potency, which has four times the amount of uh, hemagglutinin antigen in it for each of the uh, four types. Um, this is for 65-year-olds. And now there's the one with the, uh, that's got an adjuvant for 65-year-olds. Um, and, and again, it's because 65-year-olds don't respond as well immunologically to the vaccine. So more antigen and perhaps an an, uh, adjuvant to help get a better immune response is the way to go for the future to protect more 65-year-olds and older. And in fact, there is now one study in children, young children, using an adjuvant uh, influenza vaccine that shows much higher antibody response, and so very possibly within a few years we may have a, a, an adjuvanted um, influenza vaccine for young children um, that, that might work even better. Um, and adjuvanted influenza vaccines have been used in Europe for many years, have a long safety record, and, and, um, and so um, I, I see that that's very likely what's going to happen over, over time. 
In addition, because egg-based production is so difficult and you have to pick the strains so far ahead of the influenza season, the World Health Organization, CDC, picks the strains in February for the next season um, so that the manufacturers have time to egg adapt them and then get them to grow to enough volume to create enough vaccine. Other types of vaccines are now uh, being developed, and there's now a cell culture-based vaccine. Um, and actually this year, it was licensed now to children four years of age and older. Um, so that's an available option. And there's now a recombinant hemagglutinin um, uh, vaccine uh, that's licensed for, for individuals 18 years of age and older. These have the advantage that uh, hemagglutinin is the same as the hemagglutinin that you want in the virus that you're trying to prevent the infection from. So, uh, and there is some data that the, the immune response to these um, vaccines is even better uh, in terms of neutralization of the circulating strains than the egg adapted strains. So again, we may be moving in a, in a direction for adjuvants and or development of uh, further cell culture based recombinant vaccines that might improve the, the protection offered by the vaccine. Live attenuated vaccine um, <clears throat> was not recommended for the past three years because when the manufacturer went from the trivalent to the quadrivalent vaccine, it turned out that this vaccine did not work as well against whatever the predominant strain was in the subsequent year. Um, and so um, it was decided by the CDC as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics not to use that vaccine uh, for the past three years. Um, the manufacturer has changed the formulation um, and so it's been relicensed and there's a difference in the recommendation now for its use from the AAP and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. So um, AAP and ACIP looked at the same data. <clears throat> the vaccine uh, does have uh, uh, good immunogenicity. Um, the first failure of the vaccine was against an H1N1 predominant year. We haven't had an H1N1 predominant year since that time. However, um, in, in immunogenicity studies, the vaccine appears to be really good. Um, and so uh, vaccine got licensed by the FDA and ACIP says you could use it for anybody who's in the age appropriate uh, 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 range um, who um, uh, is eligible for the vaccine. The AAP is a little nervous about that. <coughs> and, and, excuse me, and that's because the, even though that there is serologic data um, for prior uh, quadrivalent vaccines, um, they, there's a little worry that it's never been proven with the quadrivalent vaccine to have a good response in, in, in patients. So the effectiveness is not known against H1N1. We may be up for H1N1 year this year because there was H3N2 for the last couple of years. And so um, that one, there, there's concern by the, the Red Book Committee that, um, um, that this vaccine is not proven for H1N1 effectiveness. And in addition, when compared to uh, inactivated influenza vaccine the last few years, inactivated vaccine appeared to work better than the live attenuated. So um, the way the uh, uh, COID put it was uh, LAID may be offered for appropriately aged children who would not otherwise receive an influenza vaccine. So if you got a child that's really needle adverse and their parents would not want them to get vaccinated unless they get the oral, or I mean the nasal spray, that would be a situation where you might use it. Dr. Ann Cherry and I decided we might consider that for school-based um, vaccination, um, and uh, but uh, as it turned out, final decision was we were going to uh, use the uh, um, uh, inactivated vaccine. And so, as you know, Dr. Van Cherry is leading a, a group uh, that he and I are involved with that uh, we're going to try and vaccinate children in multiple parishes in school this year who don't get their vaccine in their primary care providers' offices. And so, let's see if we can increase the flu. Uh, Great. 
<clears throat> One thing that you need to be aware of is that children six uh, months through eight years of age need um, two doses of influenza vaccine the first year they get the influenza vaccine. So the, you need to really use that first dose to prime them so that you can get a good response. So the first year they always get two doses. There's some children who end up only getting one. This is a, an algorithm for how to decide who needs two doses and who needs one. It turns out because there's not much change um, that uh, uh, for children who uh, had two or more total doses of any trivalent or quadrivalent vaccine uh, before uh, July of this year, they only need one dose. If they didn't, they need two. So um, we're gargling, we got influenza vaccine, but you still get influenza. If the vaccine fails, we treat. And so there's uh, been a significant change over the years in our recommendation. We used to not treat a lot of kids with influenza. Now we want to treat most kids who have influenza. So <clears throat> um, these are the recommendations from the AAP. So if a child has uh, influenza, uh, whether they've been vaccinated or not, uh, they, uh, these are the ones that you want to treat. You offer treatment for children who are hospitalized with suspected influenza or those who have uh, severe, complicated, or progressive illness that are, is attributed to influenza. Treat individuals who are uh, suspected of influenza of any severity who have a high risk condition. So um, if they have sickle cell disease and they didn't get their influenza vaccine, they got influenza, they need to be treated. Um, um, and then, although we do know that, the, uh, that treatment works best if you start treatment within 48 hours of onset, we, no matter how long they've been infected, uh, how long they've had symptoms, we're going to treat that group of children because there is some evidence that even though you may not modify the disease as, as well, um, you can potentially prevent the degree of severity. So uh, we're going to use the drug for that reason, even though it's later than 48 hours. And then you consider uh, treatment, again, irrespective of immunization status. You've got a healthy child with suspected flu, uh, or um, those who have a sibling or household contact less than six months of age, uh, or with a medical condition that predisposes to complications, because in those cases, you want to try and reduce the risk of exposure of that individual to influenza. Um, does oseltamivir work? Um, this is a, 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 a meta-analysis of all of the studies that are available uh, comparing um, oseltamivir to placebo. Um, and it's very clear that uh, oseltamivir does decrease the duration of illness. Um, and um, uh, asthma is a little more difficult to deal with. Um, the, the, the improvement is not as, as great, but um, uh, when but you can significantly reduce the duration of illness with oseltamivir. Almost every one of the studies favors oseltamivir uh, therapy in the uh, intention to treat populations that are infected with flu. Um, we have a number of choices. The uh, zanamivir has not really been used much in the United States. You've got to uh, inhale it. Um, it's uh, contraindicated in kids who have asthma. Also, Tamivir is the primary therapy. It can be used to treat or as prophylaxis. Paramivir was um, um, licensed last year. It's given as an uh, IV injection, single drug, single dose, um, in children two years of age and older. Dr. Vancheri and I have a protocol in place that uh, we're uh, uh, to look at this drug for children who are under two years of age. Um, and so we're recruiting patients for that study. And then there's a new drug called uh, uh, Biloxivir, uh, which uh, is being looked at by priority review by the FDA, and it's suspected that maybe in December uh, that drug will be licensed. Um, it, it has a different mode of action. Again, it's a single dose, but unlike Paramivir, which is IV, this is an oral drug. Got lots of data. Um, this is one study that was just reported in the New England Journal just a couple of weeks ago. 
showing that it is, appears to be even more effective than oseltamivir uh, in, uh, in shortening the course of influenza. Uh, so that may be the next drug that's licensed. Uh, for pregnancy, um, the recommendation is that every pregnant woman gets influenza vaccine if she's going to be pregnant during the flu season. Um, and uh, um, the latest data is that uh, um, it, um, it, the influenza vaccine will reduce hospitalization in pregnant women by 50 percent. Um, it turns out that not only does it protect the mom, but it protects the baby. Uh, there's a reduction of risk for hospitalization due to influenza of 72 percent within the first two to three months post-delivery. Uh, uh, if a mom gets the vaccine, this is because the antibody crosses the placenta uh, and helps the baby um, as well. Um, in addition, for babies, we want to make sure that uh, all their contacts are immunized. If, they, if their contacts develop influenza, they get treated, um, and the infant can be treated as well. Unfortunately, latest data, only 50 percent of moms are getting their influenza vaccine, so we got to do better with that. So key points, we want to immunize all six months of age um, uh, uh, and older. Got to get everybody vaccinated by the end of October before flu season really takes off. Algorithm we already talked about. Egg allergy is no longer a contraindication for flu vaccine because the, the vaccines are purified to the point there's almost no ovalbumin in the influenza vaccines of the egg-derived uh, vaccine. So it's not a contraindication. Make sure pregnant women are immunized and treat uh, children who uh, need to be treated if they have flu. And lastly, get your flu vaccine. As healthcare providers, it's not only important for you, it's that you want to bring flu to your patients. Uh, or your family. I guess that's not going to go. Okay. And then that's the new drug. Okay. All right. So that's it. Any questions? Pardon me. Should healthcare providers get flu mist for the injection? They could get either. Um, and uh, the only uh, animation for uh, flu mist would be if you work in a, um, in a bone marrow transplant unit, you're probably better off getting an inactivated vaccine. But any other um, patient care area, you can use the, the um, nasal spray vaccine. Perfect. That's an overview of the subject. I didn't know about the history there. Uh, two questions. Number one, you talked about pregnancy. We deal with that all the time. So how long does the antibody title last? I have seen several papers that it could last in the first four months, three months. Again, it depends on the type of vaccine you're using. You can comment on that, number one. Number second question is, what if an adult comes to the house with flu-like symptoms who's not being cultured, but they've got children greater than six months or a year of age. Uh, I always <coughs> informally suggested go ahead and get vaccines for all those kids. Uh, or treat them prophylactically if it's a bad case with yeah. those, you know, one of the... Yeah, so uh, if, when you get flu vaccine, it takes a minimum of two weeks before you get a good response that might be protected. So if someone is exposed to influenza and not immunized, they need to be prophylaxed if they are at risk of one of the uses of the prophylaxis would be an individual who's exposed who is not so that So if someone's in the house with flu, um, yes, you can give them vaccine, but give them prophylaxis. You can't give them the live attenuated vaccine, you have right. to kill vaccine. You give them the live attenuated vaccine, you give them the flu, you're going to kill the vaccine arm. So, so you give the kill vaccine in that, in that situation. Um, the first question, was for How long the duration the of the antibody. Let's say so, the same child yeah. is seven months old. Would you yeah. give him the titus drugs? Yeah. So if the, for most individuals, a single dose of vaccine, or for the young kids, two doses, they're going to provide you protection throughout the entire flu season. So there'll be rise of titer fall, 
but you should have protection throughout the season. And in particular, you don't have protection during the, the, during the months where it's expected to have the highest um, uh, rate of expensive children. There is evidence that, um, and it's sort of mixed, that an older adult or, or an individual with a chronic condition that alters their immune response may not get as good a response. And then the tigers fall so that by the, toward the end of the season, they may not have as much and so there is some, um, there are a number of things that the CDC is looking at to determine whether there are individuals who may need two doses. Uh, St. Jude now gives all their cancer patients two doses of influenza vaccine for each season um, to give them a second boost after a number of months. Um, and so um, there, and then there are some uh, adult situations where you can find cancer patients and that's happened. So, we don't have all that data to be able to say for sure, but, there, but it is true that there are some individuals in the community probably waning from the end of the season and may be better than the food, but the majority no, probably not. Why do we have to wait until six months? Why six months and not four months or two months? Well, that's it because, I mean, for the first, yeah. So um, in the original studies of influenza vaccine, um, there was a high reaction rate for young children. Fever, febrile fever, um, that led people to say, let's wait until the level dropped down to um, the baseline. So it was more reactogenic for children under six months. Now that's something that can easily be looked, be looked at as new vaccines are developed. Um, but I think at this point, the most important thing is to get pregnant. That was the reason. Was the reaction. Last year we had a very low pregnant women in the session. Yeah, we have to do that. Okay, Carl. And so the reason why we give 0.25 instead of 0.5 is because it's more reactogenic in six months to 36 months. It's because, yeah, that dose is. Uh, because you get the good health with less reaction. Right. Yeah. So there's usually a misconception amongst some trainees that you are splitting the dose mm -hmm. and giving it and giving it a month apart. Right. So it's so, so that's a misconception that it's 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 full it's a full dose. Point zero point two five is a full dose for six months to thirty six months. Just like if someone had, if someone's four years old, they've never had a flu shot, they're going to get a zero point five, and then zero point five a month after. Correct. Yeah. You mentioned about the special care population, especially <coughs> you worried about children with chronic lung disease, number one is cystic fibrosis, and uh, premature babies. BPD and then asthma. So especially in cystic fibrosis, uh, generally the tradition from the foundation is to treat any time they coming after, even after like five days of symptoms, they treat, treat them, give them a flu. Um, yes. And also, yeah, and also if they're exposed at home, if anybody in siblings had confirmed flu, just try to start the treatment. That's kind of the foundation, uh, tradition from the foundation. Just want to know what is your opinion. Yeah, and I think that's very reasonable. I think that's the same sort of principle that we talked about with the six month old, that um, any viral infection in a child with cystic fibrosis has a potential for having a pulmonary exacerbation and, and a worsening of their condition. So protecting them the same way we talked about with uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a, an infant is really important. And whether they got the flu vaccine or not, Giving them prophylaxis after exposure is really important. So that's a, that is a good, good. Other thing is like the CF patient, they may not may not mount a fever response all the time. So any exacerbation, we have to uh, rule out flu. Yeah, that's it's very important as well. Is that the, the immune response may not be strong enough. And, and you know, with the, if the vaccine is 60% uh, effective, then if you have someone who's at high risk. You still want to protect them so they can get uh, a, a prophylaxis for that time of seven days or five days or ten days, I guess.
that you know, what kind of exposure you have. Sure, and then preemie babies, whenever there are multiple cases of apnea or bradycardia, we do RSVs. Should we do, do, do all, all body culture? Yeah, I think that, yeah. We've got several babies with rhinovirus in yeah. right now. So. Right. Any viral respiratory infection in the preemie that's still in the unit yeah. can cause them to become apnea. Right, and also bringing you in. Uh, yeah, the, the people who work in the nursery are the same people who live in the community. So whatever viruses are going on in the community are going to be introduced to where we work, and especially in a close place like the NI, that's really important. So, yep. Yeah, Dr. Okay.